Um, and it's a pleasure to me to have you guys come and sit. And you can move your chairs down. All right. Come and sit right. more close. Let's make this a little bit, a little bit cozier and a little more informal and more yeah. intimate. Let's make it more Thank you for Thank you for Thank you for Um, encouraging you to tweet and Twitter while you're doing this. We are filming this for New Play TV and it will be archived. Um, so uh, it's an important conversation and one that, um, you know, will be, will last beyond today. Um, so I'm just going to introduce to you uh, the leader of this panel, uh, Judith Miller. Judith Miller is one of the foremost Francophile translators in the country, perhaps in the world, other than Laurent. And, um, <laughs> and, she, and sitting next to her is the other foremost translator in the world. So we have heavy hitters here today, um, and they'll tell you a little bit more about what they do. Wing division of the of the uh, um, NYU New York University in Abu Dhabi. Oh boy! Wow. And uh, she, that so it's a testament to how deeply she feels about, uh, particularly about French playwriting, that she's here with us today. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> that, uh, I, I don't ever think I'll get to be as proficient in Arabic. I am in French, so I won't be able to do this for Arabic language playwrights, but I certainly hope that in the period of time that I'm in the United Arab Emirates, I learned a lot about what kind of theater is being done in that region. So, um, first I'd like to say that I'm thrilled to be here with such innovative and gutsy people doing this particular festival, and, and also meeting all of these playwrights that I haven't met before and being with my friend Laurent Bouhez uh, to talk about translating the theater, which is something that he has been spearheading in France for a really long time, and I've been translating French plays since the early 80s, so it's been something that's been very important to me to be able to do. And I've always felt that I was able to do it partially because I also do theater, and it's the act of doing theater that's made it easier for me, I think, to translate theater. But. Uh, I think it'd be good to introduce everybody who's here. So this is starting with our, our translators, Eric Butler and Kimberly Jennerone, who, tra who have translated Marianne, Marianne Aubert's play, right? That has two different titles. Well, we'll call it <laughs> Pride and Headlessness at this point, okay? And <laughs> Michel Hainer and Emily Jane Cohen, who've translated Nathalie Fillon's play, who's right there. And uh, Nathalie's play is called Out There, Al West. And then uh, Rob, uh, no, 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 Rob. Mel Rose, excuse me, who is a director who runs a theater here in San Francisco that you probably all know. And the, the Cutting Ball Theater. The Cutting Ball Theater, right? And Rob has translated Samuel Carey's play, Communicate Number, Communicate number 10. So. Um, we've all been talking about different aspects about translating these, the, the plays that we've been thinking about, but I have a whole series of questions and I think I'm going to just throw them out and then whoever wants to jump in and kind of start to answer this, I think that's great. But, uh, and so I think we should start with, with a, an easy question. I mean, easy in the sense that everybody's going to have an answer for this one. And that is uh, the question of hurdles. What was kind of, what were sort of the major hurdles that you encountered in thinking about the particular play that you were translating? These plays are quite different, okay? They're really very different. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the plays or read the plays. I know that you were here for both sessions, right, yesterday. But you know that um, the, the play that you'll be seeing tonight out there is a, is a very quickly, we call it a dysfunctional family drama after, after the financial crisis in 2008. Whereas Communicate Number 10 is a, is a play about alienation of the urban underclass and the projects. I'm, I'm sorry for these short, cryptic 
but there's kind of help explains what they are. And pride and headlessness is this crazy, surrealistic kind of dark lark in, uh, that, that takes us through the mind of, a, of an author who's engaging with the act of making theater at the same time as engaging with the act of kind of exercising family demons. Okay, so that quick sort of uh, does a synopsis of these plays. And so, again, major hurdles in the translating, how you had to figure out what, what to do if you had problems with register, if you had problems with tone, if there were special words that caused problems. Uh, if you had to do some research, you need to, to be able to think through the translation of these plays. Who wants to start? No. <clears throat> well, I, um, I, I was really excited to um, translate Samuel's um, play um, for, 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 for two reasons. One, I, I loved it. And um, two, because the, you know, the, the 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 language I thought when I first read it was kind of was was straightforward, and as I um, as I read it, it, as I got tangled into it more, um, I, I realized it was actually quite quite difficult for me um, for two reasons. One, I I've, I've translated you know probably um, ten plays before before this, but they were I was always. In, I was always translating plays that had already been translated, so I was basically, hopefully, writing a, a better, fresher translation. This was the first time I had ever translated a play that, that has never been translated before, so that was its own challenge. And the second challenge is that um, the the <laughs> and, I, and I say slang, and I realize I I, I misled people. I, everybody thought. I meant that there's a lot of swearing in the play, and there's there's not a lot of swearing in the, in the play, but there's a lot of there's a lot of language used in interesting ways, a lot of dropped words, a lot of um, syntax that's interesting and creative, and, um, and 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 a lot of words used in in different ways. I would find I, I would find myself late at night on, on French language forums, you know, with, with other translators um, reading about. You know how, how words can be used in certain contexts, and which, which you know, when I'm translating Ionesco or Sartre or something like that, I, I, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to do that. I, it's it's more um, clear. But then the other thing is getting a sense of Samuel's voice, which is, you know, the the language in French is not complete. You know, simple that the so the sentences uh, 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 Judith asked if we did research, and I have to say, probably the thing that helped me most is having read a lot of Falk. You know, having a sense how to sustain those sentences because that's something that. Um, Samuel does very well. I mean, someone will have a monologue, and, and a sentence will be many, many um, lines long, and, um, and, and, and and anyway. So those are my those are, those are my big hurdles, but they were they were fun to work on, and I, I'm grateful that I had Yvonne and Samuel to, to to help me out when I got stuck. And I think um, the, 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 the one of the things that was really handled beautifully in the translation was, in fact, the uh, this complexity of shift in registers, which happens a lot in contemporary theater right now, between the kind of sparky dialogue in parts and then these long monological things in other parts, and everybody has kind of experienced that in the translating that they're doing. And Sure, I can say something about, I mean, uh, that is something that's common to all of the plays that we worked on. Um, Natalie's play in particular, there's a lot that's lost, I will just confess that up front, can we say that, admit that we lost so much, because it's full of rhymes and assonance and puns that cannot be translated into English or words where you just have to choose, and sometimes you'll have three characters going one, two, three, one after another, and they'll be all using a word that rhymes, you know, with each other, or, um, you know, I mean, we were still talking about the problem of translating the word thong, and 
there's certain scenes where you've got to pick one or the other. I mean, it's just not yeah. going to work. Um, I think that the thing that I was personally most worried about in translating this play is that um, that people take it as some sort of view onto reality that you know that we it's not reality TV. I mean, it's not a real that. It, it helped me, I mean, first you asked yes, the research question. Um, this is maybe a, what the French call déformation professionnelle. I do research no matter what about everything. I'm just a nerd. And that's but in fact, the research for this play was looking at certain resonances with, with, with this. There are things in common, but it's really important to get that this play has all kinds of genres mixed into it, that it's not at all realistic, naturalistic, and the original language, because of all that wordplay, you don't need to provide that many cues. I mean, it's just there, built in, and I think we were always worried about maybe you want to say more about that, but we tried to, mm. <laughs> you don't, I was going to say, that was my cue, take the yeah. microphone out of my hand, please. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> May I ask a question about what you just said, though? Does this mean that, that you kind of, in addition to being a translator, you also have to be a poet or a writer to do that. Does it help? Um, or is that what you become? I would never say that I'm a poet or a writer, but um, yes. so okay. <laughs> but yes, you have to be a writer to be a writer. <laughs> yes. Okay. Then I don't know whether we did. No, but um, <laughs> there are. There is actual. Yes. I should say that there are poems also in this. I mean, not only poems that are poems that people know, like the Odyssey, or or you know. Um, uh, but but there's also like, but Natalie herself wrote a poem for this play, which you don't always know when you're reading. As a there also there are also expressions that are invented. I mean, there's this one thing where somebody laughs like a we translate laughed as a mountaineer, rire comme un comme un alpiniste. But if you're reading that as a foreigner, you have a, something in your head. I know as a translator is a, oh maybe that's an expression. <coughs> maybe everybody in France knows what that means, and I better start doing research to find out. And in fact, no, it's invented for the. Um, I just want to respond to your question of do we have to be writers and poets, and um, I'm going to say uh, yes, I think that you have to find in yourself to translate um, your own, you have to sort of have and trust that you have a writer or a poetic sensibility. I think it also depends very much on the writer. I don't think, um, I don't think that I would be a good translator for everybody's work. I also think that I read this particular work and felt that I sensed the something about Natalie's writing or poetry that uh, that spoke to me and that I felt that I could be an honest translator of, and that would not um, that that that's certainly not true for every piece, and that might not be true for other translators either. But it's my case, um, and certainly as much as Emily Jane might say, oh, I don't, you know. <laughs> She's, uh, uh, you know, having sort of been, um, you know, worked closely with her, they were so, there were many moments when I would read the original and I'd read what Emily Jane had, you know, written as a first pass and I'd say, oh, you know, yes, you know, this is really the essence of it. Um, but I do want to say that I think as a translator, this is something, I hope this doesn't go too much into the next domain, but I'll, I'll just, uh, say that I think that there are times when people who really build themselves first and foremost as a writer and poet do wonderful translations of other people's work and neither Emily Jane or I actually bill ourselves first and foremost as a writer poet who writes uh, their own material although Emily Jane writes professionally and I've written a lot of things and, and uh, we both love language and literature and in this particular task I think that that can nonetheless make us good translators. Because in fact, our egos as writers or poets are not necessarily in play in any sense. And even as much as we have our own sensibility, the stamp of our own you know, voice is, a, is perhaps more fluid. Therefore, may be able to, to bend towards trying to
uh, right hurdles. Well, I, I'd say the hurdles, the whole thing is a hurdle. Because, um, no, and this is what I liked about the play is everything that the various characters say, they say in defiance of everybody else. <laughs> so, uh, the main task for, for me at least, I don't know about Kimberly's perception of this, was, but what I uh, tried to do was sort of see what energy and presence was there in the language when I read it in French and then try to create the same sort of as it were, this plastic quality, this sort of statue-like material uh, aspect of, of So that was, uh, so it wasn't, you know, word by, well, so of course, we had to proceed word by word, but at least I was thinking about the words as sort of forming large blocks, big masses, each of which had its own articulation and impact. Uh, so that's where I would locate the hurdle. So it was a series of hurdles because you're jumping through a landscape, so to speak, that is made of, uh, of, of language because each character kind of takes this material and sculpts it into something different. And then you bend, weave, and duck, and sort of leap over it uh, as you encounter it. And then try to subject the, uh, the, the audience to the same thing. <laughs> Another obstacle, creating a, a similar obstacle course. <laughs> it's hard for me to think of hurdles right now because I just think of it as a joy. Um, it was really a joy to translate uh, this work, and especially with Eric, who is sort of maybe the fastest translator I've ever met. Um, we sort of got the script and I turned around and he had a draft and I was She's like, not oh. just saying that because he's her boyfriend, and by the way. He is the fastest translator I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, no, it's, <laughs> it's extraordinary. And he, um, he, doesn't, he doesn't waste any time thinking about what the, you know, he's not pedantic, he doesn't think about the literal. He doesn't worry about the literal because he immediately gets to what the, the heart of the, the, the meaning is, which is a real gift. Um, well, after a few days of fasting and prayer. After a few days of fasting and prayer. So really for me then, what I had was it was a joy. I had, as he said, you know, the engine. You know, he sort of gave me the engine. I went, oh, now I get to think about the, you know, the, the doors and the, and the windshield wipers and, you know, maybe rethink the structure a little bit. But I mean, um, for me, then I was um, faced with the challenge, I would say, of the cultural translation. Um, having known uh, Marion's work, um, one other piece already, I knew that she wrote for a very specific context, and she had a lot of in-jokes, and in-jokes are part of her, her work. Um, and for this play, when we realized that some of the references were French, and they weren't landing, you know, we decided to go ahead and start scooting the play closer to our audiences, um, to the Central Valley even. Um, and that was a fun, a fun challenge. Um, but in the process of play development, of course, there are people who um, who feel, oh, but the play is French and it's set in, in, in France, and there's this wonderful, you know, we're all Francophiles over here today, right? So um, there's a sense that French things are, are, are beautiful, but in a way it makes it safer, too. And this is not a safe play. This is a, a violent, rough-edged, very immediate play. And to, to say, you know, um, that it's set in, in France, where maybe they think those things kept it at a distance. So for me, one of the, the wonderful challenges was um, finding ways to make it to make it read in all of its complexity and its internal jokes um, and its references here in this culture. What so, was that Central Valley? Was it the Loire Valley in France? No, no, I meant, I meant well, we actually had a reference to Fresno, but it got cut during the reading just because they cut that part of the scene. No, no, but, but what was in it France? French? In France, oh. But before you changed it to Central Valley. Le Gare, Don Le Gare. Don Le Gare. Somewhere okay. that's South, actually not. South of France. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a lost place. It's a, it's a very dry, very beautiful, dry and lost place. Uh, yeah. Yeah. South, South of France. So, so Mediterranean, sunny. But, you know, not, not incredibly, not a cultural capital, uh, to put it mildly. Very hot, very, very dry, and a little rustic, right? So we were thinking, what's the equivalent for San Francisco audiences? And, you know, none of these equivalents are perfect, but you try to scooch as close as you can to help things land. 
I should mention that we thought it was very important in our translation that, in fact, it be very situated let me, let me in stop. Paris. Oh, I'm, just, I'm stopping Michelle just a minute because this actually leads us right into oh, the second yeah. question that I wanted okay. to ask, which is actually the question I think that's, that, that's, that underlies a lot of what, has, what, what we've been thinking about the translation and is something that's important to Laurent to think about and, and that he wants to have a few, say a few things about. And that's the whole question about translation versus adaptation. And when you move a uh, play text into a cultural space, which is not the cultural space from which it emerged, uh, how you go about thinking about that, what, what's, what is in play when you're thinking about that, why it's important to do it, why it's not important to do it, what gets lost, what gets saved, all those kinds of questions. So that's what you're going to be talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'll say a few words about it, and then maybe Emily Jane can say some more about it. We felt that it was very important that this particular play so feel there's a big difference between adaptation and translation. And I do think it has something to do with ego. I feel like um, when I'm translating, I, I embrace the experience of giving myself over to someone else's vision. And, and as a director, actually, I had a wonderful experience. Uh, I, I've directed a lot of Beckett. And, and um, you know, I'm used to directing Shakespeare, where I, I, you know, just a trial some Cressida, where I set it in Iraq in 2003 and stuff. So I'm used to having my um, directorial voice, you know, really present. And with Beckett, of course, I had to, you know, the, there are actually rules. You get arrested almost if you if you if you mess with his um, his ideas. And so, um, you know, I was, I was directing at the Guthrie um, Happy Days, and, and you know, I, I really realized, hey, I, I can't I can't dick around with this stuff and. But I found tremendous freedom in just saying, I'm, I'm just going to do the best version of the play that, that Beckett wrote. And I found that actually my, my voice was there in, in, in a way, and, and, and that I found a lot of freedom in those constraints. And just like with um, you know, translating, um, I, I, I think um, what's fun about translating is really trying to you know, do the best Samuel Gallet in English um, possible, and and not not try, trying to not have it be my voice at, at all, but really trying to have the challenge be, you know, um, his voice. For you know, my my little adaptation challenge, um, I, I feel like I didn't have as big a um, hurdle as because you know, jokes are, I think, are hard and. You think about Commedia dell'arte troops that when they would go to different towns, they would change the jokes to fit fit the town. So I have great I have great sympathy, and I I, I understand. I, I, it makes it makes sense to me why you, um, you you made those changes. For me, the challenge was um, the, <laughs> the where we put rich and poor people in our country is different from where um, they they do in Europe. So you know here, the rich people live in the suburbs. And the uh, you know the working people live um, in in the inner city, and um, in in the um, in, in France um, it's exact exact opposite. The the wealthy people live in the city, and um, the you know the the the, the working class the working class people live outside um, the city. And so it, it makes it. But if I use the term suburbs, you know, for where the projects are, that just would conjure the completely um, wrong picture. So that's where that's where I you know I had to look for words like outskirts and periphery and, and things like that to get to get a different word out there. But there's no way around it. The, the word has to go through you, the, the the translator. So you're in a way kind of the sieve through which we receive the word. I mean, everyone's you can't be invisible as a translator. You can't. I think that's a really, really important question because I want to say that I don't, I don't believe there's such a thing as a, as a literal translation. I mean, it's kind of fairyland where words would just have equivalents that you could just plug in. Like that doesn't even exist. Every time you choose a word, you're making a choice. Absolutely, of course. Um, and it's interesting to me that we still have a sense of the sanctity of the text here, even though we've been fighting in the states for you know 40 or, or 50 years. Um, because we're so free with our choices as, as directors, for example. Sometimes I will have um, students who are afraid to change a word of the text, but they'll cast a lead role that used to be a man with a woman, you know, or they'll set it in some, in some world, and I'm like, you know, that's much 
bigger interpretive choice that you're making than that word that you didn't want to change, you know, like you didn't want to change pal to buddy, you know, or whatever, but you would, you would change the gender of the, the lead person. So to me, it's wow. really interesting Amazing. how, um, how much we still believe that there is a kind of, um, core that is true and absolute and firm that maybe there is something exact there. And we don't, we don't feel that way in, in other aspects of our, of our creative work. Um, so for me, what the translator can do is, first of all, give us a sense of what the words were and what order they were in and, you know, what the shape of the, and the structure and the internal dynamics of the pieces, but we can also have access to, and this is sort of an extraordinary thing that has been made possible here, where we actually get to talk to the playwright and say, well, what did you mean? What about Le Gare, you know, was, was the reason why you chose it? And, and why, why this word at this place? Why Femme de Vaux? You know, why Chonchon, right? So I got to ask her all those things. So for me, that made it you know, beautifully easy to say, okay, the end joke about Femme de Vos, okay, Marcus Gardley, right? Because can you imagine that scene when you didn't know that there was an end joke, you know, about the, 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 the playwright? It would have... You had to change that. Absolutely, sure. Sure absolutely. That. So for me, what I feel like, if, if a script like this is, is published with somebody who's interested in meta theater, with somebody who is very interested in watching the process of creation and the place where it's being performed landing, what I can do is give people options. So if this were to be printed, you know, I mentioned this briefly to Marion already, you know, we might choose one way, one set of references, and then put a note and say, here are the choices we made during our reading in San Francisco, right? We changed X to Y, we changed, you know, Z to, to U. You might do, the, you know, something similar, but to let, to the, you know, the, the potential producers know that these jokes are meant to land and that there are different options for them because directors make these kinds of choices all the way with their casting and their design and their even just the, the style and the pace of it. Why not give them the option to translate things if the playwright herself feels that this is a play that can move through cultures and doesn't have to be French. Right. But, right. But, Go ahead. But, but you can do this because of the specificity of the play that you were working on. Oh yes. And if you, if, you were, if you were working with this different kind of a text where the energy in the text came entirely with the rhythm and you decided to switch the rhythm entirely on it, I think at that point you've done something that's incorrect, that you have not translated the text. Different texts would not And, and so, so I, I think that this question, I, I, the blanket statement that you made at the beginning about there's no sanctity of the text, I think we have to be careful when we I say that. Well, because you know, I am of the deconstruction generation, so it's not that I, I just wanted to say that it's not that the text I didn't by Smith specifying there's a, there's a difference between adaptation and translation. It's the point was not that the text is sacred. I think what worries me, particularly in the American context, because we talk an awful lot about multiculturalism in this country, and yet we don't really have it, or or it's very symbolic. It's window dressing a lot of times, and it's very easy for Americans to think, for, particularly with things that come from Western Europe, that it's the same. Hmm. Um, and, I would, and that's why I, I, that emphasis on, you know, no, it's not the United States, and don't fool yourself for a minute and thinking that that's very important to me. And, and if, if we had made it more that way, for instance, by changing the names of places, not using Brittany, not using Paris, I think that that, that would have been really a tragic rendering in some way. I mean, it would be a, a great loss. So um, that's that's why I mean American culture is absolutely everywhere, and and we're a little bit disconnected, but from you know what real difference is, even though it's, as I say, it's a big topic here. So. Yeah, and I mean I'm sure that Laurent wants to talk about this, but one of the things that I've heard him say frequently is uh, one of the things that happens when we go see theater pieces from other countries that have been translated and that leaves something of the otherness of the country there, is that we experience that otherness in a different kind of a way. So that instead of going to the theater and seeing ourselves, we're going to the theater and we're seeing something other than ourselves that then can become us. So I mean, that's, that's a kind of interesting thing to, to contemplate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there have been said so, much, so many things. Uh, from now I, I hardly have uh, anything to, to say more about uh, the real, uh, the high quality of your reflection about what is translating. But yeah, in a general way, uh, I think Antoine Vitez, because we have Maison Antoine Vitez, and Antoine Vitez used to say 
uh, all the plays of humanity are one and a single text written in an infinity of different languages. And everything belongs to us, we have to translate everything. And this is the motto of Maison Antoine Vitel. Uh, and it's a, the, 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 the Babel theory, it's Ariel. It's about the same thing, written in different languages, uh, which have created or are linked to different cultures, uh, ways to see the, the, the world. But there is, a thing, there is a common language, and it's because there is a common language that translation is possible. Uh, it's, and so, um, the, most of the time, the question for me when I, when I think about uh, translation is how much are we ready or willing, or, or willing or ready, it depends, it's not the same thing, to host, to, to incorporate from the others, but in order to found ourselves. Uh, to, it's, like, it's like in a, a love relation, you, you have to know the differences to know what's in common, and this thing in common is the act of uh, of translating. So, when I heard about uh, the debate uh, between translation and adaptation, I'm not sure it's an artistic, uh, it has to do with something artistic. Adaptation, most of the time, had to, to deal with ethnocentrism, that means that 100 or 200 years ago, when translate, translations were made, uh, and these things change with uh, German and French Romantism when really people were looking uh, uh, outside their country to see how it is. But before of this, each country, each town used to, to consider itself as the center of the world. So everything that came had to fit to the to the standards of your own country. And, and because there have been travelers, because there have been people that went far away and discovered other stuff, uh, you slowly and slowly became aware about the, the differences. And the, the evolution of translation, because I don't believe at all that uh, there is a, a theory of translation. Translation is always about experience, and all what you have said reflects this. A, a translation is an experience, as writing is an experience. You don't, when we translate, we don't translate a language. We translate what an author does to his own language. We translate a translation. Uh, and after us, the, the director is another translator. He translates what we translate uh, uh, from the translation of a playwright. And that's why in this, in this uh, progression, every single uh, step is, is absolutely important. And that's why translators are not less important than directors or less important than author and maybe that's the sense of you have to be a writer when you translate uh, but you also have to be a dramaturg you also have to be you have to be connected to the to the whole thing and uh, yeah okay that general stuff but uh, I just wanted to, 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 to put it this way yeah, and, and I think um, I actually wanted to get back to thinking about Rob talking about uh, directing Beckett. You know, the Beckett translated his own plays. And if you put uh, his play, Waiting for Godot, next to the way he wrote it in French, on Godot, you have a text that you would call an adaptation. 
So uh, it, one might call right. it an adaptation, right? right. It's right. certainly not anything like a literal translation. So he's thinking very much about how the jokes will fall, how the rhythm works, because he's thinking about the audience who's going to receive it in English rather than in French. So that it's, I mean, obvious, and he wasn't, he didn't want anybody else to translate his theater text, nor did he really want anybody else to ever direct them. So, so what Laurent just said uh, about, do we have to be writers if we're going to be translators? I, when I, I didn't mean that we had to be creative writers necessarily, right, or playwrights ourselves, but I don't think that you can be a good translator if you're not on some level a good writer. You just can't. You have to have a sensitivity. But Laurent and that Natalie actually requested that we make a difference. And that the sense of openness, I think, in the room to uh, to having the having the expression. and uh, kind of landing as possible. Another word right now. Um, was important to us. Okay, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, um, I'll try to make this brief, although this is a question that speaks to my heart because this, um, this collaboration is Our playwrights, and um, a handful of actors were there and got to hear a, a draft. And based on that one Skype meeting, um, we went home and, and changed hundreds of. of we found that the <laughs> periods were real stoppers for our actors, and we knew that Merlin's text had to go, 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 go. So we, there was there, you know, changing into, into, into commas, um, you know, making more contractions. You know, you think when you're translating. You know, ex and then since we've been in rehearsal this week, um, you know, you keep hearing actors stumbling over something that didn't, that seemed in a literary fashion fine, but obviously it's not yet flowing theatrically. Um, then you find, I actually heard all this week, strange leftover gallicisms um, <laughs> that seemed okay on paper, right? But then, and actually, I wonder if you felt this, Rob, but um, I, had a, I had a revelation yesterday when hearing Rob's piece because I heard the word caca. And we had caca in ours. This is fun translating, right? We were cleaning up caca until the last minute. <laughs> we were literally we were cleaning up caca in the last minute because I heard it and I went, "Oh my God, caca in our play is a gallicism. It should be poopy, right?" So <laughs> you know, we had this moment of, and it wasn't until I heard it in Rob's play that I was like, "Oh yes, that's the, the way French people." Because caca is a word, but no, poopy is really the better one for 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 us. Can I, can I ask this question? Does anybody? Does anybody use? Because Amy said caca when she was growing up in her family. So I'm wondering if any other Americans use caca. In Latino culture, we all call it caca. And how many of you but you're use not, this poopy? This is not Latino culture that uses caca. No. No. Or gosh. Gaga. Gosh. Gaga. Well, you know, the, the thing is so, when so, I... So, you know, it might, might actually work, but I don't... That's very well, obvious. It worked, oh, it worked yeah. okay. Would you work fine? And look, then we got a lot of things like we got, you know, cleaning up poopy and we got hot in the poopy. And let me just say, actually, and I'll, I'll relinquish the microphone after this. That um, we talked to Sharon, we talked to Sharon Lockwood, one of our our cafe, and I said, "Oh, maybe poo poo, maybe poo, maybe doo doo." And we sat there for twenty minutes, and I said, "Well, what did you say with your?" And her husband said, we said shit. I said, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what the mom says when she's frustrated at the end of the speech. She goes to Mount. But she's trying to talk in that tone. Like, And there was a book, apparently, that a lot of parents um, of this generation are reading. Like, somebody goes poopy. Because I think the mother in that speech was reading a lot of how-to parenting guides and how do you talk to your child and what to do that's appropriate. And I think 
know one translation. For a different generation, Kaka might be better. For a different part of the country, do you know what I mean? This is the joy of translating. <laughs> hey, can I jump in here? Because I'm, I'm just really glad we're talking about poop. Because that's, that's all, you know, it was such a, you know, high, it, it was so high, um, <laughs> you know, this French translation <laughs> panel. Now we're talking about poop. But, um, but, for, um, but, but, but for me, my relationship to poop is, 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 is that um, in the play, you know, I, I kept it caca because it, it, the, the line is the, the caca on your, um, in the caca in your mouth is, it, it, it is worse than the caca on your shoe. And, um, you know, we, we where I, I would probably, if, if I was only talking about stepping in dog poo, I might say, do, you know, I'd say dog poo, but, but we don't often say, oh, he's full of poo. We say, you know, we right. say he's full of caca, you know, you know, he's, you know, you're, you know it, the, he's just saying caca. So that's why, you know, it was important to have the, um, you know the, the the figurative idea of your words being kaka, which which made it make make sense. And I, and I just want another thing I want to jump up on. I I don't know why it is, but every play I've translated at a certain point, especially when the actors are speaking it, I ask myself, why did I always translate it? Cannot do not. And and I, I and, and we start reading, it and, and and the actors are very. Um, you know, observant, and they and they're very respectful, and they say, "Do not go there. I cannot do that." And I keep thinking, "Oh, that sounds so terrible." And I don't know why. I don't know why it is, but I always, in rehearsal, realize I've got to change those all to can'ts and don'ts. And, and I don't. I don't know why it is, but I. It, it's only when I. It's the. It's the last thing that happens with the text. Mm -hmm. that, anyway, I think it's interesting that, that that you have that experience too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talking about. Uh, I mailed and everything. I think probably I, I'm always dreaming about an international translation workshop dedicated to humor mm -hmm. and to slang. Maybe. Because humor and slang are the probably uh, the most relevant things about uh, what, what the culture is. If you take, for instance, uh, our slang in France, and I'm speaking about two uh, French-speaking countries now. In France, we have a relationship to, 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 to bad words, which is uh, relate on, on, uh, on shit and on sex. We say bordel, we say merde, we say uh, nique ta mère, fuck your mother, etc. etc. <laughs> when, we go, when we go to... Quel con, con, connas, etc. <laughs> it's sex, it's, it's genitals and, 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 and uh, fecal. Uh, and when we go to, to Montreal, for instance, <laughs> it's about religion. <laughs> and uh, I'm a translator from German, and when I translate a play from south of Germany, or Bavaria, or Austria, where the Catholic religion is very important, uh, all the, the bad words they are saying it, uh, relate to, to, to Jesus or to, to, the, to, the, to the, the, the Virgin, to etc. Et when you go to the North, it's completely different. And the other way, the other workshop that would be really interesting is about humor, because humor is the, the distance uh, a, popula <coughs> uh, a, pop a population people have with themselves and this distance uh, reveals lots of things about what uh, a population is so the humor is yeah it's a distance you keep with your own reality in order to 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 reflect it to, to see it and from one culture to another it's really difficult to to translate uh, humor and to put it in the right way that was that is the thing that was so fascinating in the reading yesterday about Marion's because it has such a kind of specific French humor uh, and to see it it was not an adaptation uh, it was a translation uh, and it worked and but it, it, it works in with other uh, with others uh, uh, rules with other so, so that makes me think about 
um, what was what was the French for slut? Salope. Salope. Tutus. That was what that was the French for. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. in this particular one, yeah. Yeah, because the, the but that to get back to this question of adaptation and translation. So let's say you're translating a play from Canada, from French Canadian, because this is something that I've run into, and you have this awful word, the most awful word that a French Canadian can say is tabernacle, <laughs> which translates as church, right, or or you know tabernacle or <laughs> or temple, and Obviously, that means absolutely nothing in English. So, what do you translate it as? I mean, usually I translate it as fuck. Yeah. Except that the awful thing is now French Canadians are also using fuck. So you can have top of fuck, fuck, and then you get fuck fuck, and the next thing you know, you have lines of fucks because you can't the, to get the connotation, to get the strength of that connotation, that you can't go anywhere else in English. So then you have to start inventing. Anyway, not that you wanted to say something. Does Southern not mean the same thing to Haitians? No. 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 Doesn't mean the, doesn't have the same dirty connotation. So, Haitians don't say Tabernacle unless they live in Moyad. And there are a lot of, <laughs> and actually there are quite a few Haitian writers who live in Moyad. Yeah, I, I wanted, because I love this discussion. It's, it's because it's so, it's so about writing all the things. And, uh, uh, you know, I realized the way we worked together, um, uh, I really appreciated a lot, again, the, the time we had to, to talk. And uh, for I, my problem is that I speak and read English, so I, am very, um, I, can, <laughs> I can be very anxious about the translation because I, uh, I feel English language. And, uh, what really reassured me a lot uh, was that you asked so many questions and that you were so um, anxious about knowing what I meant because I know how difficult it is to translate my writing. I, I use words, uh, I choose words who have many, many, several meanings, you know, so it's impossible to translate this part of my, of my work and I know that. So I'm always very anxious because I know there will be many choices uh, to, to make and, uh, and the participation, the, just to be, I was so sure that you wanted to know what I meant and what I mean is not necessarily what is written, you know, it's also, it's also <laughs> translation sometimes when you write what you mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, you, then you try, to, yeah, yeah. It's so a translation, you put, to put it in some words or in a sentence, in a, uh, and uh, it's very organic, you know, this, and, uh, and it's a way to the possession somehow, you know, and, uh, with, and uh, I felt that it's like, a, I agree with you totally, it's like in a love relationship, and sometimes you trust people, you know, I really trust you, trusted you guys, the way you work, so you just go hand in hand on a way, and, and there's kind of a nowhere land then when the text appears, you know, which is Uh, uh, self exist. I don't know. There's something magic about that, you know, really. But it has to do with possessing or not possessing. And, and I, I love the way. pick up on something that um, that Kimberly had said about how uh, with distance when you step back from something that you see vestiges of Gallic syntax and things like that and I think and on the one hand you always have that in translations I mean that there's the or, you know there is that structure that somehow you don't want it to be there and it creeps back in on the other hand I have to say that in some ways I'm less worried about it. I mean I see it all the time also because you know, we do these books and then a year later I pick them up and I'm like, oh my God, that, you know, you see what language that was originally in. But in fact, you know, in, particularly in English, we're living in this world where so many people speak English, right? And now we have this globish where, I mean, my husband works in an office where maybe two people are native speakers of English and there are 50 people there and yet they're all speaking to each other in English. And so they're using 
I mean, so that these other syntaxes are creeping into English and vice versa anyway. I and mean, that's part of the fact, you know, the language is not a fixed thing. And so maybe it's not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to get rid of that, but it's there and it's not necessarily bad either, um, that that's part of the translation process. So. Yeah. Oh, say something about that. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, something I like when I you know, translate either either in French or from German is is to try to to try as much as possible to keep you know, but especially because of Shakespeare, you know, we're used to having all kinds of crazy syntaxes, you know, and and what I often try to do is is I try to mirror the French syntax and see if it could work in English, and if it absolutely can't work, then I'll change it. But I like to try to, you know, tr try to have the word order, you know, match as close as possible, and try to have, you know, because, you know, we, we, you know, we have so many, you know, borrowed words, I, li I like to try to have the, the sounds of words be sim similar. I, I, I once read a translation of, um, of a play where the playwright um, translated animo as beasts. And I just felt like, why in the world would you, you know, you've got a perfectly good, you could translate it as animals, animo, animals. It's, it's so close. Why would you translate it as, as beasts? I, 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 I don't, for me, I don't understand that because I feel like you're, you're changing both the sound and the, and, and the idea of it. So I, I like to try to keep it as close as possible. I, it's a good example. Uh, the reason why you, you sometimes have to translate uh, animal with beast is because you can sometimes say when when a woman says from a man c'est un animal mm. so she doesn't say it's an animal she says he, he's a beast that's it's it's all, everything is a con is a question of of of, of context uh, so yeah and I've forgotten what I want to say but you could come back but we 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 say we can say about a man he's an animal. Okay. okay. So yeah, yeah. What I wanted to say is to 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 to, to respond to. I wanted to to add, add something about uh, the legal point uh, part of it, as Maison Vitesse is also uh, uh, an institution, uh, an association dedicated to defend the status of the translator. There is one thing uh, we we want to defend in France is that the translation, the translator is the author of his translation. The words he uses are his words and he's responsible for the text he has written. And that's in, I suppose here it's the same thing, but in French, um, in, in the French, uh, face, in French law system, the translator and the author in our uh, author society, because we don't have agencies, we are represented by uh, the SRCD, for those who, who, are, who are here, which is the, uh, the society responsible on a national level for collecting the money of the, of the productions and the part, and, the, and gives the parts to everyone uh, who is involved in the process. So. Uh, the authors and the translators, they have the same status. And when, when we have a, a, a foreign play being uh, produced in France, the SACD asks the authors uh, and the translator how they want to divide their... their uh, uh, comment dit les honoraires? Uh, the, the royalties. The royalties, yeah. And, and it's, so it's, you have the same exactly and, and, and this is very simple, and that's why it's important when a producer, a, a production is done, that you have the name of the playwright and you have the name of the translator just uh, above, because uh, under, because it's it's not the translation of someone else, and each translation is different from another. So it's important to know who has translated the play. 
but this does not work like this in the United States. And very frequently, one never sees the name of the theatrical translators, ever, ever, ever. A play by Yasmina Reza is a play by Yasmina Reza, if it's in French. It's the same play, but that's a whole other issue about <laughs> what kind of theater she writes, I think. changes with every production and different casts and different directors and different times and places when it's done. And I think that's a gift um, to plays, to continue to have different lives every time that they're produced. Um, and just as texts will have different lives based on different translations. I'm in the middle verse, epic. And it's wonderful for me to have those to choose from, some in rhymed couplets, some in prose, some in verse, at places in a lot in others, some stuffy and elevated and poetic, and some completely, you know, contemporary. And it's, it's, it's wonderful as a, considering that plays are pretext for performances, or that they're, the, they're, they're, they're one part of performance and that the rest has to happen around it, it's wonderful that we have options to, uh, to choose from. And if I could bring it back to Shit. Um, I was thinking we're an august company here because we've been talking this week, some of us, and at the center of, of, his, of his play, the beginning of his play, and throughout his play, is the word merde, which is shit with an extra R in French. Um, and this, this word, merde, um, and the translation. So shit, right, doesn't... And then when you put the extra R, say mail to it properly. Oh, no, I don't want to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Some of us are blushing that we're even discussing. Such anyway, a it, it has a wonderful sound to it in French, and shit kind of falls flat. So some people have said shitter, for shit. Somehow to make it... You know, why don't you... Or, or so, there is, there is merde. And the alliteration with perdre, lose. Yeah. So, so it's it can be hours of investigation. And he took um, instead of translating it the same way. It's about that, and you're. Your choice behind it. It's fascinating. Well, one one of the most you know famous lines in in literature is "être ou pas être," and um, and and mer, ha, ha, you know, ha, ha, I feel like it's almost a verb form of of merd. Uh, and so I, I and, and and you know, of course, Jerry is is playing on um, the Scottish play Richard the Third. All all these. Um, Shakespeare plays, and so the first time he says it, I have him say to shit to her, and then um, and then and then later on it it, it, it gets shorter to to shit to shit, you know. So it, it so it becomes to shit, but it's this, it's this kind of verb form, and 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 it, it gets the idea of Hamlet um, that it's that we're going to be messing with Hamlet in the in the play. Get so perfect. I, I, I'd like to ask one last question because I don't think we have that much more time. But this, I'm going to ask this question of Rob and of Amy because I, I think the final act of translation is a cultural translation in the institution of theater. To the mouths and the bodies of actors who are not from these other countries. So, my question because Carrie's not here, but you two have directed these plays, how have the actors experienced <coughs> these texts? Have they been changed by encountering these texts? Have they felt that they're encountering something other than a text by an American author or by American authors? Sure. Sure. 
You start. You start. I think I, I can speak for myself and having observed um, uh, pride, I'm just gonna take it down to one word. <laughs> um, uh, I can think I can speak a little bit about that. Um, for our actors, the idea that something seemingly naturalistic was in fact um, stylistic and that the language is is resonant and poetic and that the style of the piece shifts and changes and, and employs different kinds of stylistic strategies to get its to 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 tell its story um, was really uh, you know eye-opening challenging and fun and um, I don't I, we didn't really we didn't really struggle we have one actor that we really that we that we uh, wanted to um, uh, really work And um, um, I think the sound of the language, not interpreting, but overlaying it with an idea you know, say, I'm now an actor, and I'm going to act this character, was for Natalie's play, 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 play squashy. It was, it was, you know, shitting on it, poo-poo. Yeah, just like, <laughs> that, it was, that it was squashing it, and that to find kind of a lighter, uh, uh, a lighter expression for the, for the play was hard, because, you know, you want to, to perform, you know, you want to perform, and in fact, the performance really, is within the context of the words and that the structure of the language itself was what carries that particular play. And I think you know what was really is hearing the text spoken by the playwrights themselves together and we did we assign each other the episode. And but uh, about how they were reading, uh, and we couldn't tell when it was shifted from character to character. We couldn't tell where the it was just driving. And Marcus, uh, Liz, and myself just should just know how to be performed. thinking about that and it's energy uh, so um, so uh, so we'd hear the text and I have a night one or two or three this is happening but then day that we were going to read them, we were reading this. Oh, this is what she wrote. Okay. And it looks like, you know, uh, on the page, it looks like, uh, um, a like a conversation. It looks, looks like realistic dialogue. But we remember what she did with the performance of it. that way. And we just sort of finding nuances. And we said the nuances here that we have to respect. And uh, and she said, that was good. Well, and I asked her, so what do you want us? Did, did we do it right? And she said, yeah, that was good. And we asked him someone. And we, sometimes they give us a few notes, but generally they said, no, that was great. That was it. Uh, so we took our cues from their own performances. It really helps to hear the playwright read their own text sometimes. Because you kind of understand the, uh, the sort of the, the, the shape of the work. Yeah, we, we, we did that by Deborah's pool. I, I got to hear <laughs> Samuel re read the entire play in French, and that was really helpful. We have a, you know, we have a terrible practice in 
in American acting that comes from TV and film. And in TV and film, the director will often say, you, you, you know, you don't, you, you, you don't have to say, you don't have to To say the word, it's just 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 say something. Get the, yeah, get the feel of it. Get the feel of it. And um, you know, since actors go from film and TV to theater, powerful actor will. Sound natural. Words that are are hard and make make your mind have to think a, a, a different way, and and they're used to exercising that um, that muscle. Look at that again, because you're actually not saying what's on. Weirder, and um, and and they say, could you could you you know a, a direction I like to give sometimes is read read it again, but read it like you're being a situation and action, and it's more about listening to the sound of the words and being in tune with that. I I, I have my Kindle, and I've got, I've got a huge library. Let me read you this. And look, look, listen to how it isn't natural, but it, if you just give yourself over to that, and, and notice how I'm not trying to make it sound real. So, um, I think that's what kind of the sound and the rhythm, and, and, and as someone else said, the energy of the piece. Uh, it, it was an adjustment, but I think it's an important uh, adjustment to give people. I think we have to end now. So I, I would just say that I think probably the greatest challenge of translating French contemporary texts into the American contemporary scene is precisely what it took. The differences in... Who are going to be thinking in these kinds of terms? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rethink how Americans approach acting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes mm -hmm. really. So Amy says we can continue this conversation in the hall. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll break up some wine. I know y'all yeah. want to have a little glass, so Thank yeah. You. Um, and we can. Uh, Thank you, Drew and Balthar. Thank you, New Play TV audience. We will be with you again. It's very interesting. Yes. 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 Yes.